I've been meaning to do a video about this and I'm going to try to make this a very quick and brief video about analogies. And yes, I have a very provocative title. I'm planning on calling this Atheists Anal About Analogies. This comes from the Freudian teaching that those who fixate in a certain level of development, in his case the anal period of development, would be structured people who tend toward, and this is a newer term, not in Freud's day, obsessive compulsive behavior. But I have to, to, to discuss this because it drives me absolutely bonkers to hear all these ridiculous analogies and uh, similes, false metaphors, the whole nine yards. But I was watching a video of Craig, William Lane Craig debating uh, Shook and watching as he goes to analogies. And this video is, is, is a taunt toward atheism yet, or atheist, poor atheist uh, debating skills, but it's also a warning to the Christian community in debating folks on the, the avoiding the pitfalls of analogy. Why do we refrain from using analogies in general? And why do atheists immediately default to an analogy? Why can't they state their position in a logical, numbered, premise manner? If you guys are reading my posts and, and, and the other posters on this channel, You'll see us repeatedly requesting that the people posting or debating us post a num numbered premise argument, laying out a formal argument, a logical argument, a valid argument, even though it may not be true, just give us a valid argument. But the atheists default always to these analogies, and that's why I call this video Anal About Analogies. Why do they have to go to analogies? If you have a logical argument, you should be able to premise it and number your premises. Why are the people who claim that we're rational, we're irrational and they're rational fail to present a rational argument for their position? I was watching the uh, Rational Responder channel dis debating an, atheist's on, an atheist on the law of contradiction. And the atheist could not agree with the law of contradiction but claimed that there was no proof that the law of contradiction was true or that he believed that the law of contradiction was not necessarily true at all times. And the problem with that is that eliminates the ability to communicate, to rationally think, or anything. He was thinking and claiming to think like a rational thinker, which ev it invokes automatically the law of contradiction. That is, that the premise A, I mean the conclusion A, cannot equal non-A at the same time in the same way. And that was the original terminology that we were using when I was in college. Now it's also said that A can e cannot equal non-A at the same time in the same meaning, manner, use, or sense. But in other words, mathematically, as easiestly expressed is, A cannot equal not A, period, ever. And that's the reduction is when you put it as a mathematical expression from trigonometry. And it is the foundation of all thinking. But when we go with this atheist, he kept trying to give examples and get off subject. And that brings me to the point of why atheists, in my opinion, default to an analogy position. Why do they go to analogous teaching when it's fraught with problems? To avoid refutation. And I'll explain it like this. The reason, and I, as a teacher over the years, I've used analogies because we're always trying to go with the... Uh, St. Patrick's style of the four-leaf clover, the three-leaf clover trying to demonstrate the Trinity, trying to give teachings that are examples in the material world that would express abstract concepts and make them more concrete for the students. The problem with an analogy, though, and it's fallen in, I've given false analogies, is that it is difficult to get a truly analogous example from the material world on an abstract concept. But and, and this is how you would now analyze it, is we would look over at a chart and we would lay out each portion of the analogy. And, and we pull this from geometry, from plain geometry. When you're making an argument in geometry to justify that you believe that angle um, Z equals 26 degrees and you give this long argument for it. Well, the problem with that is in trigonometry, we can say we can have congruence. And that would be the equivalent of an analogy. It doesn't have to be exactly equal, but it has to be congruent. It has to all be the same proportion so that we can say, well, this triangle is congruent to this triangle. This triangle is 20 feet tall at its apothem. This triangle is only 2 inches tall at its apothem. But they are congruent. They're equal in their angles. They're equal in their proportion. So when you give an analogy, you have to look over your analogy and break down each item. You know, if we want to give the gardener analogy, is the gardener truly the example of God? The, the, for those of you that are, are familiar with the invisible gardener uh, analogy of atheism, is the invisible gardener truly reflective of God? Is it congruent with God? And do all the premises match and do all the relationships in the analogy match? And the problem is, most of the time they don't. And this is why I got away from a lot of analogous 
teaching because if I gave an analogy that was a false analogy, it caused people to infer things from the analogy rather than from the concepts we were talking about, from the rudimentary facts we were giving them, they went over to the analogy. But that, in my opinion, is why atheists go to analogous teaching, because it's a form of camouflage. The moment that they bring out an analogy and I start having to be forced to debate their analogy, it allows them to get off on tangential rabbit trails ad infinitum. It never ends because once you're dealing with this problem with their analogy, they want to argue over that problem where you're saying that's not truly analogous to what we're talking about. And then they'll jump to the other one. But this part is, and you're constantly trying to out fire after fire of the false premises, the false implications, and the false arguments. What is implied in an informal, or what is what occurs in an informal argument? Well, in an informal argument, you always get a lot of problems with... Um, implied premises, hidden premises, um, skipped premises, and always non-secondars. You're always plagued by it follows from when it doesn't follow from. So by jumping to an analogy and not giving you a numbered formal argument with laid out premises that can be easily refuted or tested, they jump into this analogy. And then you're stuck trying to fight an analogy and, and argue analogy. And for my advice to you guys is don't debate an analogy. Tell them, stop right there. I don't want to debate and go down a thousand different ra rabbit trails on a thousand different tangents trying to show that your analogy is false. If your argument is sound, give me an argument. Give me a logical argument. Logic is beautiful. It's like mathematics. It, it, either A or not A. Either statement A is true or statement A is not true, not A, or not A is true. It's that simple. It's yeses or noes. It's binary code. It's the foundation of all thought. If, if this is up, then this is down. If not up, then down. Which direction are you pointing? Not up. Well, then I'm pointing down. It's that simple. That's rational, logical argument. If you want to debate that, that's fine, because you can tell me I am not pointing up. Which way am I pointing? Down. You can argue and debate whether or not that was a truth statement or whether I'm making a proper syllogism. Two premises and a conclusion is a syllogism from Aristotelian logic and other logic back in ancient Greece. But those are easily debated. We even, and for those of you that don't know logic, folks, we have syllogisms and we have truth tables where we input various truth tables and we can test the truth or falsity of a conclusion or of an argument based on the input of true and false premises and how they react and how they work together with the conclusion. And, and we can test this. This is all foundational basic logic 101 or logic 99. So if you have a rational argument, give it to me. Give me numbered premises. Give us a real argument here. But from now on, I think we're going to start deleting analogies because the first thing I hear out of atheists is the false analogy. Well, if, if Jesus is the Christ is God, then Easter bunnies have wings. Ooh, this is ludicrous. It's asinine for you to say something like that. But that's all I get in lieu of an argument. What is in lieu of? In substitute of. With the lack of an argument, I give in lieu of. With the lack of an argument, I give you something else. So you'd, if you had a valid argument that there is no God or that Jesus was equivalent somehow to Easter bunnies, then you would do it. Easter bunnies and the flying spaghetti monsters are all myth uh, formed by pagans and, and neo-pagans and occultists, maybe a few atheists. And they're not comparable to Christian theism, which is a rational religion based on what God rationally approached us in the material universe and said, touch me, feel me. I'm here. I'm not a Buddha trying to claim that nothing exists, that this is all an idea. He comes and tells Thomas, if you don't believe me, reach into my side. Stick your hands where the sword pierced me, I mean where the spear pierced me, and touch, put your fingers through the holes in my wrists where the nails pierced me. And no, why would God take all this time to make rational empirical arguments if he was this nut job um, Buddhist total Eastern sold out full of contradiction God. He's not. He approaches us through Logos, through logic. It, the Bible establishes that Jesus is the Logos, the reason, the, the, the source of reason, not just the word. So if you want to come at us 
give us arguments. And folks, don't accept the analogies. You'll, you'll be here arguing all day long about non-issues, collateral nonsense, while the atheist sits there reveling in his own puckishness that he's gotten you off subject and you have not def been able to finish defeating his fundamental claims that have no premises or his fundamental argument that has no logical foundation. Stick to the subject and stick to the issues. And this is my opinion on why atheists do that is because they don't have any solid fundamental argument that wins. And why? Because atheism can never be proved with logical necessity or otherwise. Atheism can never be proved. The day that we claim that there absolutely is no God because we checked every speck of the universe, there still could be a part of the universe we didn't know existed that we didn't check that could have a God hiding in it. You'd have to be able to account for the entire universe. Last time I'm going to give this. Well, probably not. In order to claim that there is no God, you have to be God. You have to be able to account for every subatomic particle and prove that there is not a nano-God hiding behind any kind of quark or other subatomic particle, as well as any macro-atomic structure throughout the universe where he could be hiding. So you have to be present in every point of the universe all at one time, and you have to be able to examine every point of the universe. You have to account for every item and object in the universe. Therefore, by all definitions of Christian theism, you'd be God yourself to prove there was no God, which would make you God, which would falsify your, which would prove false your argument. Because in order to prove there is no God, you have to be omnipresent, omniscient, and in order to do both of those, you'd have to be all-powerful. So, boom, uh, omnipotence. So, they're the three of the major uh, distinctive features of God. So, don't give us analogies. Give us arguments. And Christians and theists out there debating, don't accept analogies.